Well, uh, well uh, today is uh, the first Sunday, as Praveen was uh, mentioning. Uh, and uh, also, he mentioned about the Epiphany season. We'll talk a little bit about that. But today is also known as uh, Baptism of the Lord Sunday. And uh, the reason for that is we have moved into the season of what we call as Epiphany. Uh, what is Epiphany? Uh, so we are now learning some new words, I guess. It's the manifestation of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles as represented by the Magi, the Magi who went and gave him gifts. And they presume that after his birth, sometime later, the Magi came and Jesus was not just a person for the Jews or for the nation of Israel, he's for, for the world and the Gentiles were being now introduced to Jesus Christ. Uh, it's supposedly a moment of great revelation or realization that God is with us. God has come with us. Let me just um, go to the worship calendar. Uh, I don't know if you can see those words that are a bit small. But um, if you see uh, right on top, you have Jesus is in the yellow coming. Advent, that is the beginning of, the, uh, of our worship calendar. We start with the coming of Jesus, the Advent. And of course, Christmas, Christ is born uh, as a human being. And then if you notice uh, in the gray area, now his ministry starts. His ministering to God's people starts. And if you look be below that, it is called the Epiphany. So the Epiphany starts somewhere on the 6th of January uh, and uh, beginning with, of course, uh, it includes the um, baptism of the Lord Sunday, goes all the way down to uh, the, what do you call it, uh, the Transfiguration Sunday. So we will be coming to that also, Transfiguration Sunday, uh, that is before the Passion Week, Ash Wednesday, you know. So all of this is the, what do you call it, the epiphany season. Uh, if you notice after that, then comes the most crucial aspect of Christian belief and doctrine, the crucifixion of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus, saving, is, that is the Easter or the resurrection Sunday preparations. And... We move from there, of course, he's risen, uh, Easter. We move from there to the building of his church. If you notice, after he's ascended, the Holy Spirit comes, the church, the building of the church, which we call ordinary time. And then we go back into repeating that cycle. So this is the calendar that we would like to focus on. Uh, in the past, we used to have an old covenant uh, calendar. We used to have festival days and we used to have, uh, you know, of course, the Sabbath uh, services. And we used to connect that with Jesus. And that was good. And it's still, uh, you know, good to remember that. But what we have deliberately done is we have moved from the shadow into the reality. And we want to focus on what Jesus did in his ministry, right? And many times it goes back and uh, connects up with the Old Covenant and old, old Testament, I should say. The Old Covenant is no more. We are in a new covenant. So we want to focus on what Jesus did for us and all the various, uh, you know, his uh, various acts of salvation and his baptism is that. And so we need to focus on that. So we are moving away from the shadow into the reality. Right? So we want to ask the question, what, is G what has Jesus done for us? Many times we Christians jump forward and say, what must we be doing for Jesus? And there are some people who will say, oh, this is, I'm doing this for my Lord. And that's good, and you need to, and we need to think about that. But you really can't <laughs> get it right if we don't understand uh, what Jesus did for us. All right, so that is what we are now going to focus on during the Epiphany season, on into the Passion Week, 
and to the resurrection, and then of course we talk about the building of the church. All right. Um, so don't get distracted by just saying what should we do for the uh, for Christ and for for Jesus. And yes, that we need to ask that question. But before you ask that question, we need to ask what did Jesus do for us. And so the question we must now ask is, since today is the baptism of the Lord Sunday, why was Jesus baptized? Now, we have explained that in one way or the other, and many of our pastors have also spoken about, you know, aspects of that, but it's, it's necessary that sometimes we revisit and understand what is it that we are, uh, what, what we need to understand from uh, this particular act of Jesus being baptized. So his baptism comes with his public ministry, his public appearance, right? His baptism begins his ministry or his, uh, I mean, of course, his ministry began with his birth, uh, but the public ministry begins with his baptism. Uh, now, what do we understand about baptism? Most, most of us are familiar with that. It's a very important are, uh, uh, what do you say, a sacrament in the church. All of us or many of us are on, on, uh, you know, all have been baptized one way or the other. We always associate baptism with repentance, right? Remission of sins, that's what Peter said, right? Repent for the remission of your sins. We believe in, or we think of a watery grave. We are going inside the water, so it's like a watery grave. It's like a death. And then we try, as we are hopefully coming up soon, uh, soon enough, uh, some like to jump up a little faster. Uh, we are uh, leaving our past behind. The, all the sins, that the water has become black. <laughs> uh, we are leaving our past behind. Resurrected, almost like a resurrection to a newness of life. And then when you come out uh, and the pastor prays, and ask for the indwelling of the spirit, then we say, welcome to the body of Jesus Christ, or welcome to the family. You know, I don't know how many occasions I have hugged people and said that. And then, after all of that, we are euphoric, we are happy, and then one week later, we are hitting our head, uh, our thing on the forehead and saying, why am I sinning still? <laughs> we go back, because we are not perfect, we keep falling. We'll talk about that in a moment. But Jesus being baptized, did he have anything to repent of? <laughs> uh, did he have anything, any sins to remit? Uh, you know, if we say yes to that, then uh, uh, our entire Christian faith is gone because Jesus was sinless. There was nothing that he had to repent of. Uh, then obviously the question is, why did he get baptized? Um, now, the ritual of baptism uh, will, you know, uh, as we answer that question, let's understand the Greek word baptizo or baptisma, uh, you know, de depending on uh, how it is, uh, the, the context, which means immerse or dip, wash. Wash is quite, uh, 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 you know, uh, popular, I mean to say, uh, important aspect of baptism. To make clean with water. Or you can even say bathe, right? So you can use this word uh, colloquially. If you are uh, going to have a meal and you wash your hands, you can ask the question, did you baptize your hands? That's uh, perfectly valid. <laughs> you can say, did you baptize your hands? Right? Don't forget, next time you go to the picnic, uh, before you eat, baptize your hands. <laughs> um, but this water rituals hold great importance for purification, spiritual cleansing, not just in Christianity. I'm sure you recognize that in, even in ancient civilizations, water rituals were part of their practice. And uh, very interesting to see how they, or they, they performed these water rituals, right? Uh, these water ceremonies, uh, was central to their religious practices. And so it is not something that we discovered in, in the Christian faith. Uh, they were very much practiced in, even in um, ancient Egypt. 
ancient Egypt revered the river Nile. The river Nile was uh, almost like a god to them. Uh, you know, uh, a sacred river. Uh, and they had ceremonies uh, that, what do you say, to honor the river. And the water was sacred and apparently brought fertility and prosperity to the land. And so they would provide all kinds of ritualistic practices to the river. Ancient Greece was another place where sacred baths and immersions took place for uh, representing spiritual transformation and rebirth. Ancient Israel, Leviticus, talks about water rituals, right? Washing of hands, washing of pots and pans, right? Uh, uh, and, and, and especially the priest, high priest Aaron, also had to bathe. For what? As it says in uh, Leviticus 16, uh, the the Aaron, before he entered the most holy place, shall bathe himself with water, baptize himself with water. Uh, and then it says, and it was for an atonement for himself. So these water rituals were a way to atone and make yourself purified. The practice in the Islamic faith, they use water rituals. Uh, washing specific parts of their body before they enter for prayer or enter the mosque or wherever they would want to pray. Uh, it symbolizes their physical and spiritual purification. And uh, some of you know that our, we have a, uh, a school driver uh, who is a, uh, is, belongs to the Islamic faith and sometimes I see him, you know, uh, specific times of the day when he wants to pray, he would go and wash and sometimes he's, you know, lifting his legs and and putting up his sleeves and making sure it's washed in a way, you know, a very ritualistic way. Uh, he's, a, he's a good man and he's a very, faith, you know, I'm going to say a very strong faith in his religion. But it's very interesting to see how he does it with such meticulous order. We live in the, you know, where, uh, what, 80% are Hindus? And do you know there are water rituals with the, with the Hindus, right? Uh, the ritualistic bath in the mighty Ganga. Many times I see on uh, TV when they go to the Ganga and they do their pilgrimage or whatever, they will go and dip themselves, bob up and down, you know, seven times or something or 12 times, I don't know uh, the number. But, uh, uh, but that is part of the water ritual. Uh, some of them bring the water back to their place and they even sell <laughs> Ganga water where you can use it for ritualistic purification. All right, having said that, just to put, uh, you know, put it into context, uh, water rituals, bap baptismal rituals, you could say washing. Remember, baptiz baptism means washing. Uh, all are you know, practiced in various uh, cultures and religious faiths. But what about John the Baptist? Uh, he was also starting to baptize, if you read, I mean to say, uh, going back to our scripture reading. Um, once again, there are, they don't have proper records to exactly understand, but maybe John the Baptist came from the, uh, the Essene sect. You may have heard of the, the Jewish, some of the sects among the Jews. The Essenes were very ascetic, uh, very, very ritualistic, or even the Qumran. You, know, you have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Uh, that's where the, uh, the, Qum, uh, the people of Qumran, they mm -hmm. preserved the Dead Sea Scrolls. These were all ascetic uh, sects of the Jewish people. And there is, a, uh, uh, there is a story that maybe John the Baptist uh, belonged to them or came from that tradition. But when he was on the scene, it was a time of spiritual dryness, right? And we have heard our pastors talking about that. 400 years had gone by, no word from the Lord, no prophets came. And suddenly John the Baptist appears. And people are very, very curious. Oh, there was no prophets. And suddenly a prophet has appeared. And now he's saying, you know, I am a voice crying out in the wilderness, preparing the way for the Lord. And immediately when they said that, when he said that, people thought, oh, it's time for the Messiah. Messiah to come. 
right? But the problem, <laughs> Messiah came and the fellows didn't even recognize that, many of them. But, the, but uh, uh, he started preparing the way and uh, started baptizing in the river Jordan. And that became even more curious for people, baptizing in the river Jordan. You remember river Jordan struck a chord with them. Before they went into the promised land, what did they cross? The river Jordan. And so they thought to themselves, ah, Israel is going to be, the nation of Israel is going to be restored. Maybe he's doing this in the river Jordan. We can cross the river Jordan and enter the promised land. Right? So that is how many, many people came to be baptized by John the Baptist. But John makes some, you should say, interesting statements, but confusing statements. And people were a little probably confused. Uh, he says, uh, let me see if I've got it on the screen. Yeah, yeah, I've got it on the screen there. He says, uh, I baptize you with water of repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I. So he's referring to someone. He's actually doing, uh, you know, preparing the way for this mightier person. Whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. I was just thinking, you know, uh, John said, I'm not worthy to carry, you know, his sandals. Uh, and I thought to myself, what humility. Right? I mean, look at the humility that he has in terms of, uh, on, you know, talking about the Messiah and not uh, even worthy to touch his sandals. And yet, interestingly enough, talking about sandals and these days, uh, you know, there are people running after the holy men and trying to carry their sandals and they fight over it, right? <laughs> but talking about the Messiah and he, where he says, I'm not worthy to carry his sandals, and yet this mighty uh, person, mightier than I person, as John says, stooped down and washed our feet. <laughs> Can you imagine the contrast? I thought the contrast was very interesting. Um, so John, as he baptized, is pointing, we know, to Jesus, the Messiah, and his baptism, right? He, because he says, Jesus will come and baptize with the Holy Spirit. In other words, he's acknowledging his baptism is not the final one. His baptism uh, is not the end of it all. Uh, he need, we need something more than just going in the water. You know, water ritual. We need something more. And then something dramatic happens. As he's talking about this, then something dramatic happens. What happens? I'll, ca I'll, I'll pick up the verse, or rather the reading in Matthew this time. Matthew thir uh, 3 and 13 beginning. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Do you come to me? Shocked. John is shocked. Jesus replied, let it be so now, Jesus says. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. Uh, so Jesus comes and says, John, I want you to baptize me. Right? Jesus decided to be baptized by John. What a contradiction. Right? John is saying, I need you to baptize me, and you're coming and asking me to baptize you. Right? Uh, I, for, John found it very difficult to believe, but in spite of that, he followed what was said. And just a point there uh, sometimes we don't understand. And that's okay. But when we read it, read the truth from the scriptures, we follow, even though we don't understand. And John didn't understand, but he followed what Jesus said to him. But notice that word, I need to be baptized by you. I need your baptism, Jesus. Why are you coming to me? John is acknowledging again, mine is not sufficient. I need, to be, I, I need to be immersed in the Holy Spirit, not just in water. And I think we need to learn a vital lesson there. 
our baptism, John's baptism, and however you follow it, is inadequate. Our repentance is inadequate. Why? We keep failing. We keep falling. We keep confessing our sins. And I just thought to myself, man, if we can f make a doctrine out of that and tell everyone uh, confessions accepted, only 500 rupees per confession, I could make a lot of money. <laughs> right? Everybody would line up and say, you know, okay, uh, let's offer confession. Right? Because we keep failing and falling all the time. Right? Some even doubt their baptism, if it is genuine or not, because they keep falling horribly. And then they go into this spiritual, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, confusion, and wondering, you know, I was baptized and here I am sinning again. And we doubt whether our baptism is genuine. Sins keep dogging such, you know, those who believe they were baptized. And here is a very important understanding we need to carry from this. All water purification rituals, you call it baptisms, washings, dipping, sprinkling, whatever you call it, are inadequate. Why? Because we keep repeating them again and again and again and again. All the water rituals people are going back week after week or month after month or year after year, depending on their cultural uh, norms, go back for water rituals. Of course, we, we, we would try not to be baptized again, but some people doubt their baptism and say, I need to be baptized again. What's important is for us to understand that all water rituals are inadequate. They, does not, they do not cleanse you. They just do not clean us up. And that is why I call this a dramatic moment. Jesus came from Galilee to be baptized. I, I said earlier, he, didn't, he, didn't, he needed no repentance. He had no sins to remit. He needed no forgiveness. But why? And what we have come to understand is, he did it for us. He repented for us. And that was the perfect repentance. Right? He did not need to repent again and again. But he did it for us. He was baptized for us. And he remained sinless. He did not need to keep repeating the ritual again and again. Because he has the power to forgive. But since we are inadequate, he did it in our stead, in our place. So that we would have the perfect redemption from sin. And this is what, this is what we understand from what? From what? Paul teaches, notice Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 9. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in the bodily form. He's reminding who is this Jesus? He is divine. The fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, Jesus in his humanity. Verse 10, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. It is Christ who brings you to fullness. And that is why he said he's come to fulfill all righteousness, that's what he tells John, right? And he tells in, and Matthew records it, I've come to fulfill the law, right? Uh, uh, and he is the head over every power and authority. Now look what the very important verse, dropping down to verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism. So our baptism being inadequate, we need to depend on Christ's baptism. When we are being baptized, we are actually joining Christ. And, or I should say, Jesus was baptized so that we can 
claim that baptism for us. In which you were also raised with him, that is raised with him, and that is alluding to the resurrection, through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. This is the perfect baptism. What Jesus told John to do was the only genuine, perfect baptism. And all the baptism we, we, we practice is nothing more than joining Jesus because his baptism was genuine and it was perfect. Right? That is why the apostle also says there is only one baptism. Do you remember that? There is only one baptism. I'll show you that in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4 verse 4. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. There is only one genuine baptism. A baptism done once and for all. The baptism of Jesus Christ. He was baptized in our stead for our sake so we don't have to doubt our baptism. Our baptism is only a, a proclamation that we accept the baptism of Jesus. Sadly, we are all still fighting over baptism. When to do it, how to do it. When the scriptures so clearly say there is only one baptism, why do we have to, do we have to fight over it? The baptism of Jesus. Whatever we do, all we need to do is recognize and join Jesus in his baptism. Say, I have been baptized in Jesus. Right? Uh, what happened after that baptism? When Jesus was baptized, what happened? When this one baptism took place. The, uh, the, I think it is in Mark which was read to us. The heavens tore open. That's a very interesting <laughs> way of putting it. Tore open. Right? Uh, humans, I mean, it's symbolic of humans now having access to heaven. Right? Suddenly, heaven is open for humanity. Why? Because all righteousness was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus was the righteousness of humanity. And then, when he fulfilled that, heaven was open. And we see the reality of heaven. Father, Son, Spirit. Father, Son, Spirit. They saw the loving heavenly communion. As heavens were open, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And as Jesus, as the father is saying that, he is pronouncing a blessing on all humanity. And saying, humanity, I love you because I love my son. He is the perfect, you know, human. Our humanity is now in him. And what happens? The spirit descends like a dove. Almost, you know, uh, an anointing on Jesus. The spirit comes upon Jesus. Symbolic probably of Noah's. You remember there was a dove that Noah sent af after the flood? And maybe uh, it was a dove that was, you know, then flew away. Indicative of maybe a new reality. The floods are gone. It's indicative of the... the the, the reality of the floods being gone. Death has gone. Life has begun anew. And so when the spirit descends, we have new life, new birth. We are born again. In Jesus Christ. In his humanity. We are now immersed in the spirit. And that is what John meant. He has come to baptize with spirit. So... Uh, once again, all the water rituals are of no value. No value. It is the one baptism that we recognize. And so, probably we need new water. 
to cleanse us because this water is, uh, you know, all ritualistic water is of no use. It does not cleanse us perpetually. All you have, uh, you, we, that's why many of them keep repeating it again and again and again. How sad that so many of them have to keep repeating their rituals again and again and again when we don't have to, you know. By, because by being baptized in Jesus, Jesus has given us new water. And what is that? Sorry? Living waters. And may I just put it more graphically, his blood. We are now baptized in his blood, cleansing us perpetually, no repetition needed. Jesus, the water of life, like you said, right, uh, in us. Jesus immerses us in the Holy Spirit so that the waters of living, uh, of living waters will flow out of, uh, out of us and we are no more thirsty. Just look at these two scriptures, Zechariah 13 and Ezekiel 36. Notice it says, on that day a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. A prof prophecy about the Messiah who will do this, who will just, there will be a fountain opened. I mean, that is the abundance with which Jesus and the God Almighty wants to bless humanity with. Right? To cleanse them from sin and impurity. Now, you might think, oh, this is for the nation of Israel. Notice in Ezekiel 36. For I will take you out of the nations, will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all impurities and from all your idols. Yes, this is a prophetic word for, you would think, the nation of Israel. But who was the nation of Israel? Israel representing. What was representative of the nation of Israel? For themselves? Just for the chosen ones? And they keep calling themselves chosen ones? And unfortunately, so much of abuse has taken place because of that. And it is still taking place because they think they are the chosen ones. They know. <laughs> so sad that it is. No, the nation of Israel was representing all of humanity. They were supposed to be used to bless all nations through them. That's the promise that is given to Abraham. Their blessings belong to all humans. And so this prophecy is talking about the Messiah who will bless all humanity. It's not just the nation of Israel. They represented all of humanity. All right? And when it talks about bringing you back into your own land, they say, oh, 1947, you know, Israel was formed, so that is the fulfillment of prophecy. I'm sorry, it's not true. Look at what they are doing. <laughs> That's not true. This is talking about the final kingdom, you know, the kingdom of God, when he will gather all of humanity, including them, because we are now included in that uh, promised people. Right? So, why was Jesus baptized? Jesus baptized, was baptized for our sakes, simply put. Not for his own, not for himself, but for us. His baptism, like his death and resurrection, was a dramatic expression of God's grace toward sinful humanity. When we are baptized, we are baptized into the baptism of Jesus Christ. A baptism that is linked to Jesus' sinless life and his death and the resurrection on our behalf. The Son of God became one of us in order that uh, he represents all of us before God the Father. Our salvation is in Jesus Christ and in him only from the beginning to the end. I think it is going, Linda was going to lead us in the closing song, right? And uh, we were discussing what to sing, and uh, we chose the song, My Jesus, My Savior. I want you to, as you sing that song, and you uh, sing these lyrics, I hope that you will pause for a moment and recognize uh, who is indeed our real Savior, right? My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. Let that penetrate in us. His mighty love is what 
gives us uh, the comfort and the shelter, right? He becomes a tower of refuge for us and strength. And so we worship him. We never cease to worship him. He's worthy of all, all worship because he has brought salvation to us. And so forever I love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Nothing compares to the promise we have in Jesus Christ who has redeemed us. And every act of his was an act of redemption. And let we live. Now we can ask, what do we do? We worship him. And we live into him. We allow the Holy Spirit to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so let's stand up and worship as Linda leads us.